So last month, I visited a Balwadi, a government preschool in a remote area of Goa. And there in this large courtyard, around 30 children between the ages of three and six years sat in a circle on the mud floor learning together. Among them was Shreya, a child with Down syndrome. However, her classmates did not know about her medical condition. To them, she was just another friend. So as a learning activity, the teacher took a piece of chalk and drew four shapes on the ground and asked the children to come up, jump on the shapes and call out the names. So one by one, the children trooped up and jumped and shouted, Gol, Trikon, Sokon, Ayat, circle, triangle, square, rectangle. Soon it was Shreya's turn. So the teacher brought her up to her spot and she stepped back. Immediately the kids started shouting, Bai Geli, Bai Geli. So I was puzzled and I asked the Bai why they were doing that. So she explained that Shreya was a very quiet child. However, when the teacher was not around, she was much more active and talkative and hence the children were trying to encourage her by their shouts. This intuitive understanding of what Shreya needed and their spontaneous show of support were shining examples of inclusive thinking and behavior. As children, we are naturally inclusive. Anyone can be our friend. We find a way to make it work no matter what. What happens to us when we grow up to be adults? Arjun is a lively bundle of energy with a radiant smile. He's fascinated by cars and all things that spin. Arjun has autism. So last year, a couple of months before his third birthday, I asked his parents, what are your plans for Arjun's schooling? So they informed me that they have identified a school in their neighborhood where they were going to admit him. However, they said, we are not going to tell the school that Arjun has autism. I asked them why. They said, we are not afraid of our son's diagnosis. However, we have no reaction about what, uh, no control over what the school's reaction will be. And therefore, we do not want to risk his chances of admission. Now, were Arjun's parents being paranoid? Unfortunately not. Their fears of rejection are not unfounded. There are many schools that refuse admission to children with special needs. Sometimes they admit them, but in a few weeks, a few months, or a few years down the line, they are asked to withdraw their children and put them into special schools. This is the experience of many children with special needs. Mainstream schooling either leaves them out or pushes them out. Now we have laws. We have many laws which speak about inclusive education. India has signed the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. We have the Right to Education Act of 2009 and the most recent Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act 2016. Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan, the nationwide government program for universalization of primary education states. Zero rejection policy. But these laws are not enough for our educational institutions to open their doors to children with special needs. The statistics are revealing. Though India has achieved a gross enrollment ratio of 100%, according to a 2004 UNICEF study, less than 5% of children with disabilities are in school. Now, what are the barriers that prevent mainstream schools from accepting children with special needs? There are many, but I'll focus on a few. The first one is that of attitudes, which sounds something like this. But there are special schools now, so why can't children with special needs go to special schools? Those are meant for them now our doubts. How on earth are our teachers going to manage? There are 60 children in every class. The curriculum is so vast, they are already overburdened. Fears. Fears of our educators. What on earth will happen to our school results? Fears of parents of neurotypical children. Those special children will take up all of the teacher's time and my child will get neglected. These barriers seem pretty solid. However, if in India, 
every Indian has a right and a route to vote, we have shown that we can break down barriers. How are we going to do this? How do we banish these barriers? This is what I have to say. Inclusion is a process of change. And this change starts from a very important place. It starts from within us. Inclusion is all about changing within us. Inclusion is all about humanity. So therefore, I will use the image of the human body to say that inclusion requires our hearts, our heads, and our hands. The heart of his inclusion is believing in a philosophy of inclusion, believing that all children can learn and have a right to learn together. That conviction should make our hearts beat strongly. Now, our schools, are just a part of our society and we are the members of that society so it is our values our attitudes which will be reflected in our schools so i want to ask you to take a moment to look into your heart and ask yourself what is your personal philosophy of inclusion do you believe that the best school for your child is one that accepts all kinds of learners and diversity will add value to your child's educational experience. It's not enough just to feel strongly and to believe. That conviction has to be translated into systematic policies through smart thinking. That is the head of inclusion. Now we have laws, so many laws. However, I think it's hard for people to connect to laws that they had no role in developing and almost seem to have been thrust down upon them. Therefore, people in schools have to put their heads together and think of policies and write them down. If we write it down, it's more likely to happen. And then we will own the responsibility for this change. For example, in one school, they declared in our school, all children are accepted, respected, and valued without discrimination. How do you think Arjun's parents would have felt if the school that they had selected for their child had these words printed on the school, school brochure? Everyone has to own that responsibility for change. Everyone in the school, with, starting with the management, the staff, the students and the parents. Now, policies can be written down, but they are only so good in their practice. So they have to be implemented. And that is the hands of inclusion, the hands that do the work of inclusion. Inclusive practices means that teachers change their methods of teaching to reach every learner. In one school, they just started the practice of putting inclusive education as an agenda point in their staff and PTA meetings. Within a few weeks, everyone was thinking and talking about inclusion. Hands do work and hands hold other hands. That is the power of mentorship and networking. So schools with inclusive philosophies, policies and practices collaborate and in the process, everyone grows. I work at Setu and this is what we do. Setu means bridge and we want to build a better bridge to a brighter future for all children and families and schools are very critical and sturdy pillars of this bridge. Through our Transforming Schools program, we work with heads and teachers in schools and help them to develop their own inclusive outlook which fits their particular school because schools are very similar, but they're also very different. So we encourage a process of reflection. So each school can think of their own unique set of circumstances and develop philosophies, policies, and practices which fit their situation and which are doable. For example, in one school they said that their policy is henceforth no children will be unfavorably compared in our school. Children with and without disabilities are being paired as buddies in order to assist each other. 
Schools are hiring support staff who can help the child with special needs in the classroom as well as be an extra pair of hands for the teachers. Some schools are using photographs of activities instead of the usual timetable so that children with autism or any language difficulty will understand what's going to happen next. Heads and teachers are demanding training. They want to know how to reach every learner in school. It's not difficult to do. Simple things that add up if we use our hearts, our heads and our hands, we can make inclusion work. Have you ever met a child who's decided to stop trying just because she fell a hundred times while learning how to walk? I never have and I'm very confident I never will. So just like our little toddlers who pick themselves up every time they fall and go on, let us learn from our children. And I hope the schools that have started down the path of inclusion persist at becoming more skillful at it. Because it can be done. Are you convinced? Well, thank you for that clapping, but I have further proof. I am privileged to know a young man named Michael. Michael has cerebral palsy, and I'm lucky to have known him when, since he was a three-month-old baby. Because of his cerebral palsy, as a child, Michael couldn't walk, and it was very difficult to understand what he was trying to say. Around six, when he got too big to carry around, they got him a wheelchair. Michael's parents moved heaven and earth to make sure that this child got inclusive education. So therefore, he was admitted in a Kendriya Vidyalay school where inclusive education is a policy. So on the first day of school, Michael was wheeled into the school building and he saw hundreds of children standing for the morning assembly. Michael was so excited, he refused to sit. He said that he wanted to stand. His teachers asked him, how are you going to stand? He gave them the solution. He said, wheel me to the back of the hall and lead me against the back wall. And that's how he attended the first day of morning assembly. Propped up against the back wall of the school hall. From that day on, the wheelchair was history. A small gesture made by a child in a world of standing people. With the help of his teachers and his buddies in school, Michael learned to walk, he learned to read, he learned to write, he learned to type. They learned about patience, about persistence, and how nothing can stand in the way of a fierce determination to succeed. Michael completed 12 years of education and decided it was not enough. He enrolled for a bachelor's in mass communication. A couple of years ago, he came to interview me for his final year project. What was it? A documentary on disability and inclusion. This is Michael, AKA Mike the King today. He's doing his master's in mass communication in Manglo. He uses public transport. He writes lyrics for Konkani songs. He sings in the church choir. He does the readings in church and every morning at 6 a.m. he's at the local pool learning how to swim. And he's being coached by members of his community. An inclusive school, inclusive colleges, an inclusive society made Michael's success story possible. So when I was preparing for this talk, I called him and I asked him, Michael, do you have any message for society? And he said, yes, I do. And this is what he said. People like us need inclusion as everyone is different. And if we accept that, that's good not only for us, but for society in general. There are millions of Michaels and they need our support and acceptance. What are you going to do? How are you going to help them? Please answer this question using your heart, your head, and your hands and you have to answer it there is no escape because social justice is everyone's job we cannot do it alone as individuals 
or as institutions. We are in this together. And if we do it together, nothing will stop us. And we will prove that inclusion is impossible. And we are in it to win it. Thank you.